Okay, so today we're here to talk about what digital health looks like in pharma R&D specifically and in conversation with Christina Duran, who uh, is the CDO for R&D within AstraZeneca. And Christina, you know, that is obvious to everybody when they Google you, that's the title that appears, but we'd love to know, Christina, a little bit more. You know, what, what do you do for fun? Or tell us a little bit more about you, um, of course, about your role, but also beyond that before we, you know, jump into it. Yeah, so um, I've, I, this is the first time. That, that's, I love that, Shandana, and hello, everyone. So um, as I'm Christina. I am Spanish, so I have a little bit of an accent. Um, but also British, but I don't, I don't sound like it. <laughs> um, and in terms of what I do for fun, I do like um, hosting uh, friends and uh, doing huge parties. Um, so I, yeah, uh, uh, so I, either my birthday or the kid's birthday is a, is a good excuse just to invite tons of people. <laughs> that sounds amazing. Bringing, bringing both sides of it perfectly together. And maybe then tell us a little bit about what, being the CDO of R&D is like in a in a large pharmaceutical company like AstraZeneca? Yeah, so um, uh, it was a new role. So the Chief Data Health Officer in R&D in AstraZeneca was a new role about two or three years ago. And it covers, so, um, so we're quite recent as a function, but we've been there for a little bit longer than that. And we started as a transformation program. And we cover all the therapeutic areas where AstraZeneca plays. So we cover oncology, we cover cardiovascular, respiratory, obviously now with the vaccine um, and rare diseases. And um, we, we have to, we are a team that obviously um, not only looks at digital and innovation, um, but in pharma, you also need to deliver value quickly. So uh, we just, uh, we've, we've been, we had to deliver pretty much value in year one. Uh, so how do you do that? <laughs> it's probably nearly a whole hour discussion, but uh, so yeah, we are a team uh, well known for not only bringing um, uh, innovation, but also delivery. And we do it with lots of partners. Really. Yes, that sounds great. And so for everybody who's just joined, um, we've just started the conversation with Christina and um, I'm Chandana, for those of you who don't know, I'm the general manager at Health Excel. Health Excel, we bring leaders like Christina together to solve health challenges um, with technology. So, Christina, let's jump right in, right? Um, not every organization is structured this way. So, there's generally a chief digital officer, a chief digital health officer, but you have a specific call out for R&D. What's the rationale behind it? And is there some reason why there seems to be an importance being placed on, on the R&D side of the house. Yes, um, and, and we did a review um, earlier this year in terms of how different pharma companies were organized. So it's not that, and, and, uh, so there, there are more. So meaning, uh, I think pharma and organizations go into a little, a little bit of a pendulum in terms of organizational structures. There's no preferred structure, so it goes one way and then the other. So many pharma companies centralize all the digital and IT um, functions and roles under one, one head um, a few years back. Um, others like Roche and AstraZeneca, they remain a little bit more decentralized, having a, a CDO for, for R&D, a CDO for commercial. But there are also the farmers that are coming back a little bit, you know, making it more like a hybrid, having also people, you know, within the R&D and commercial um, elements. Uh, there is no perfect structure. <laughs> That's why it's a bit of a pendulum. Uh, in one, you get more efficiencies. In the other one, more alignment um, to business areas. So we, you know, so we, we continue being <laughs> yeah. in the same structure that we that where we started. Um, and the focus in RD, we do have a digital council where we align, digital and right. commercial. I think what we see is that there are there are some use cases that they are very specific for RD, like you know, clean, how you run clinical trials. Well, there are some specific use cases that are very clear for, for commercial, but obviously bringing right. a new digital therapeutic, it has right. to be joined up from R&D to commercial as well. So um, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. And you're probably right that it doesn't really matter, right? We've seen successes and failures with different organizational structures. So that's probably not the only um, you know, factor to take into consideration. And on those occasions where there is that sort of transfer or overlap like digital therapeutics that could be applied in the R&D side as well as the commercial side, how, what does that transition look like? How do you, do you try and 
uh, trial stuff and then hand it over or as a conversation I had at the get go to say this is how we're going to structure this program. Yeah, so there is, um, is, it, is it running perfectly from a digital therapeutic perspective today? Probably the answer is no. So what we've seen is, is that obviously different markets and the regulation in different markets is happening at different speed. So those markets that are um, a little bit more ahead, like Germany, for example, so they would be building local teams to make sure that they are you know, uh, up to date with digital therapeutics. Other markets that are probably lagging behind, they're not putting the resources in market to maybe be ready from a digital therapeutic perspective. My role, I, I, I oversee probably uh, um, uh, from a global perspective, more than 40 countries. So there is the complexity yeah. Um, in terms of how we run clinical trials, and then um, we, we, we commercialize it in about 100 countries. So the complexity there lies on knowing where some of the partners of the solution are today, but also what is the scalability globally um, as we're right. a company. So then it's a little bit of a um, matching in terms of knowing which solutions that are in, a, in an initial stage, which solutions are a little bit more... Um, uh, have some evidence that um, is making a difference. So ideas, proof of concepts, uh, innovation, um, things that are uh, starting and proving the benefit versus areas that you can scale globally. So it's a differentiation then in terms of the solutions. Um, and one of the things that obviously ask, uh, I always ask when, when companies come to see uh, or um, you know, we have discussions is how quickly they can scale on it, how many markets, how many, you know. <laughs> because and that's, it's, yeah. That's your main factor for consideration, is it? Otherwise, it's very difficult. So yeah. if you're trying to launch a therapeutic and you're gonna, you know, planning to launch in 40 countries, imagine if you, each country has a completely different partner for this therapeutic, it becomes quite complex. So um, scalable yeah. partners or global partners, obviously they do help for a large pharma company. But within the realm of a clinical trial, you are at liberty and have the flexibility for it to be a much less scale solution. Am I right to say that? Um, actually, no. Um, so you can, you can, and, and this is where I think some pharma companies get a little bit stuck as well. So yes, it's very easy to run a pilot in a study in one country. Now, many reg um, uh, regulatory authorities, they do require that you have patients from their Country. So the FDA requires, and it's probably starting to require more that you have US patients, but China and Japan, for example, they also require that you have China and Jap Jap Japanese patients. So um, you would be, if, if you're planning to launch, obviously, a therapeutic in many countries, you do need to run it in multiple countries, uh, whether 40 is probably too, too many. Um, but it, it means that you do need solutions that, that um, can be um, um, scalable. And there are companies that are doing really well at that. And making sure that they, you know, their devices or uh, their solutions are going beyond one country, and there, there are some companies that are like, well, U.S. is big enough. Um, we are not yeah. interested to go elsewhere, but it becomes a barrier for then pharma companies to utilize it because uh, my 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 question to those is like, when are you going to go outside the U.S.? If they don't have an answer to that, then it's difficult to continue the discussion. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I I can't. <laughs> I just need to run the study beyond the U.S. Um, uh, um, so, so yes, and, and it's, it is possible. So uh, like we've run a solution in the last 18 months um, in 31 countries and 42 languages. So it is possible to do speed. One partner, you've had one partner for all of so them. We, we do with multiple, so we are unifying multiple partners into one app. So we would have okay. multiple partners providing the device, but you cannot put um, lots of different devices or apps to a patient in one clinical trial. Otherwise you bring right. like a suitcase of solutions and you bring that complexity to the patient. Right. So we just need to, uni so we've created a unification layer so we can make it much simpler for the patient to have it all in one, in one place. In one place. Um, it's equivalent to, I don't know if you remember, you probably don't remember anymore, when banking started going online, but everything was online somewhere separate. Right. And then now you do it all in the same place. Uh, yeah, but probably that's what we'll And AstraZeneca built that kind of coming together piece. Coming together piece from that patient perspective. So the patient okay. doesn't have to deal with the complexity that you've added um, four solutions into the study. Right. 
10. Um, and it's not only the patient having that complexity, the sites as well. I think yes. that, I'm not going to mention the, the name, but there is a company, for example, that depending on the assessment, the hospital or site would need to enter the customer information. You know, if you have five different assessments from that company, five different right. times. So because right. it's not unified. So that that's bringing things together right. from a customer perspective. You know, it's been the theme across all the, in, all the transformations in any industry, you right. as a customer. And that's great because that's promising. It says to different um, startups that, you know, we can work with many of you all at the same time, but it also tells other, um, you know, pharma companies that it is possible to do it this way, but we just got to figure out a way to unify like, like you've uh, described there. Um, also just want to say to the audience, feel free to jump in with questions, drop them in the chat in the Q&A and I'll come to them as the conversation goes along. Um, but just to pivot a little bit, Christina, what are the most exciting avenues within R&D for digital health, right? And what have you seen based on all the work you've been doing over the last number of years? Which are those exciting pockets that you know holds great promise for the future? So I think they, I always start with which problems, um, which are the biggest problems that pharma yeah. has that digital can solve, you know, and there is obviously some digital health, it could be more digital more generally. Um, from, a, from a digital health perspective or patient perspective, a problem that hasn't been cracked yet very well, for example, is the acceleration of recruitment in clinical trials, identifying those patients, you know, um, can patients find those clinical trials and can um, pharma companies find those patients. Now there is like, we've reviewed about 39 companies trying to provide solutions in this space. So there is plenty <laughs> and there's yes. probably a hundred more. Um, so obviously that is a big, big area for all pharma companies. Um, I think different, different companies are focusing on one specific part of the problem. It's a very complex problem to solve. The other one is um, the way that we run clinical trials and obviously uh, we started changing that before the pandemic at AstraZeneca after listening to patients, you know, so running them from home. Uh, it was what patients, patients were saying, you know, can we, can we, it's just very burdensome across all pharma companies. Could we right. do it in a different way? And now with digital uh, clinical validated devices, you can start running in a different way, both from a patient experience perspective, but also from a scientific perspective in terms of um, uh, uh, digital endpoints um, uh, versus some of the endpoints that are in, in, in some therapeutic areas that are really truly archaic. So how we run clinical trials and then the, the uh, benefit of digital, you know, um, digital health together with treatment to get a better outcome. Um, obviously that is an area of interest as well. But if you, if you were to prioritize pharma companies in terms of those three areas, you know, obviously um, one and two, you know, they, they would get a lot of the value of pharma right. quicker versus they still have a question mark on the digital therapeutic. And the reason yeah. being that the uh, reimbursement globally in every country or the uh, barriers of then once you get the reimbursement yeah. in terms of a scale, there are so many questions and layers as everybody on the call knows <laughs> there to solve that clearly that's an area where there is pharma companies are still exploring and starting certain programs, but on the other areas we've gone, 90% of the studies have to incorporate, uh, you know, some elements of decentralization and reviewing of um, digital technology while on the digital therapeutics, I think is much slower um, at this rate. Yeah, maybe we'll double click on those areas that you've identified as pain points and therefore opportunities, right? And with maybe an oncology lens on, because we did yeah. we'll try to hone in on the oncology aspect of R&D. If we go back about maybe six years ago, um, we said that it was almost like a mantra across the industry, clinical trials, faster, cheaper, better. Um, I remember that. And I don't know if we've really achieved faster, uh, cheaper, better, but in the context of cancer trials, what's happening with acceleration of recruitment? What do you use to do it? And maybe what percentage increment have we seen? Yeah, so um, and thank you for the person uh, in the Q&A saying, what about oncology? So I do report to, onco I mean, even though I'm a share, I do report to oncology. Um, so I can talk oncology. <laughs> so I'll refer, refer more um, in, um, in the future. 
Um, so in the terms of oncology, oncology is becoming obviously more and more precision medicine. Cancer is just a big blanket of uh, many, many multitude of cancers. Um, so actually identifying patients for recruitment in oncology is very, very specific, much more specific than looking for asthma patients probably or, or COPD patients. And the window is much smaller. You know, the patient, you know, the, the time to get into a treatment um, is very, very narrow. Yeah. So you have to be very pinpoint in terms of finding the patient at the right time. So there are some companies now in the, in the US which what they are providing is with longitudinal and multimodal data being able to identify the patients that match the inclusion exclusion criteria in the study. So that obviously is, a, is, is probably where the future of identifying those patients would be. That is at the current, current state. Um, one of the areas where we are also working in AstraZeneca is the future of how, how cancer will be diagnosed. So, um, and I don't know if people in the call have, have heard of um, CTDNA, circulating tumor DNA, which is a blood sample to check you know, so if you have a tumor, the cells die very quickly and then they get clean, obviously, through the, your bloodstream. So it's being able to detect cancer through a blood test, any type of cancer with that one test. Um, the, uh, a company like Grail with the gallery test can do this. So the future mm -hmm. then is then how do you, so if you identify patients earlier, how you do you then match to the right uh, clinical okay. trial and how do you run clinical trials which are not that late as they are today? So that's on the recruitment. Maybe on the, on the other areas, um, like uh, the way that you run clinical trials, you can reduce this and you can utilize digital technology to change the way that you run clinical trials in oncology. And there are probably some newer things that you can do in oncology, like um, um, uh, using real world um, data instead of control. Right that I think it would, it would be probably more applicable in, in, in cancer than maybe in other therapeutic areas. And lastly, on the digital therapeutics that we were discussing, many cancer treatment has adverse events. Um, so obviously being able to monitor patients to, to both uh, catch those, those uh, early and, and obviously make sure that they can uh, managed and some of those adverse events can be managed through the patient is just not having the knowledge of which symptoms are normal not normal and what do I do you know we yeah. all we all get used to <laughs> in the real real life of just taking it out of the box and putting the leaflet somewhere and <laughs> but yes. not, not checking you know we are not checking the symptoms 24 7 to know actually no that's normal this is what you need to do yeah. to avoid getting it you know it, it becoming um, worse and you may be not able to take the treatment for example yeah um, so within these areas, and I know the question came up and we were meant to talk about it in a perfect segue, right, Christina? So how do you, this is, this is actually the biggest question that exists at the moment, no matter what digital health partnership or investment you make, and no matter which side, whether it's an R&D or commercial, right? It's what value is it bringing for the pharmaceutical company? It could be monetary or other, right? So how do you think about value on the R&D side? Um, I guess on the first piece, if you know it has improved the recruitment, I think that's really clear and what the outcome is. And if it's made it faster, et cetera, or prevented drop-offs, I think that's so much clearer. But as you go into the other areas in terms of the running of the trials and the DTX component, can you speak a little bit to how you measure value? Yeah, so maybe let, let me start with the DTX as that. I can see that there are some uh, um, questions on the DTX element. Um, is running the same way um, as we run the value for a um, treatment in some ways? And it's obviously the same way that is run for R&D and commercial, which is um, how many patients can benefit, obviously, from the solution? Um, what is the reinvestment method of that solution? And then what would be the value? Now, a digital therapeutic can not only have value on its own. It can obviously, if it's um, helping um, uh, a treatment either, um, so either to increase the number of patients that could benefit from a treatment or the adherence of patients to a treatment because um, it helps uh, um, to reduce adverse events or increase that. Um, so then obviously you can have a benefit from increasing the benefit that you would have had from the treatment. Um, if it's helping to get a better outcome, 
um, I think many countries are not looking for reimbursement as a holistic solution rather than piecemeal solutions. Um, so outcome-based contracts, and I know each company calls it uh, in a completely different way, which is if we if we have a contract with a um, payer uh, in, in a country in order to get an outcome for a, a set of patients with a price, that set of outcomes could be for different things put together. But obviously that's where it depends where the country is in terms of the uh, reimbursement of um, uh, digital therapeutics. So that's in the digital therapeutic space. Would, would you say that's quite far ahead, right? So when you're um, trialing a drug with a digital health asset with a view to talk about or show, demonstrate its combined outcome, um, at that point, reimbursement is still a far path, but are you suggesting to reflect on how will we get this combination product reimbursed? So the, the discussions in a pharma company of the value of a treatment or, or a digital, they, they, they become at the beginning of the um, uh, approval. Uh, so if you want the investment for an approval of something, um, you, you then need to have what the benefit will be and what the assumptions on the reimbursement path or the go to way to market would be um, in order to get the investment. So, um, and that's why it's newer in this area. You know, some markets have it, some markets don't have it yet. Uh, I know it's evolving um, yeah. still. Um, and that's what makes it much harder um, for pharmacists to go, yep, we're just gonna add it to, yeah. uh, uh, because it's just not that clear. Um, I can see that. and. Would you have, say, you know, drug cost X, if we bring it to market, goes through all the trials, but drug plus digital health, so this whole digital therapeutic combination, if it goes to market, it's going to enhance our sales by 10%, or, sorry, that's too high, 1%, right? So is that kind of the line of thought to build a business case? So, so uh, and that's where it goes back to the reimbursement. So, because the way that a, a trial would be done is what is the outcome, the healthcare outcome that you're expecting right. to have? What are payers expected to pay for that outcome? <laughs> and yes. therefore, what is the sales value that you would, you know, based on the patient population and reimbursement patterns that you would expect to have? Therefore, you know, what would okay. be the you know? So, it's done the other way around, as similar to a treatment. Okay. Um, how many such um, trials, if you're allowed to say, are currently running in AstraZeneca where you're using a digital health asset as part of the trial? So we've got quite, um, we've got, um, so that there are different angles uh, angles here. In terms of having a, a review of the digital health strategy as part of a phase three trial, we, we implemented last year that 90% of new um, phase three trials will have to review a digital health yeah. strategy. That may mean, that doesn't mean that everyone will include it, but at least there is a call for action to do that review. Um, so 90% uh, last year, we, we, it's quite interesting when you, once you put a 90%, you get to 100% because most, you know, most studies then don't want to be the 10% that didn't do it. Right. Um, and then what we have is then incorporated solutions either for recruitment or solutions for how to run the clinical trial or innovation in terms of how to do the clinical trial will, real world evidence, et cetera. We have incorporated um, digital health solutions either for a um, digital biomarker or a device, et cetera. And we have probably, we are supporting about 90 studies at the moment across AstraZeneca. From a digital therapeutic or to bring out a digital therapeutic, we are in the first stage, probably in around um, seven to eight studies where we are starting to do that combination. Um, but um, what we are identifying is that we probably, it needs to be done separately sometimes because you do need the evidence separately then to be able to combine. Payers do okay. also want the, the difference evidence of the combination of different parts. And this, uh, this is super, right? Like just getting those concrete numbers and would you say relative to the rest of the industry, is this on the high side, low side? On the, uh, in terms of bringing digital health to studies, um, I'm, I'm currently in a, in a uh, coordination group with 14 other farmers uh, um, working on how to reduce carbon emission uh, across uh, farm and obviously digital health can help. Right. So we've, we've been obviously sharing where we are from a digital health perspective. And from a, how we run clinical trials, I think we, 
you know, they, they put in the 90%, we already did it last year. I think most pharma companies are thinking to do it next year. Okay. Um, in terms of um, piloting solutions on clinical trials, every pharma company is piloting. I think where we are a little bit different is the, we've been able to scale in terms of doing it in multiple studies and then multi 31 countries, you know, that is scaling piece is where many pharma companies get stuck. On the digital therapeutics is very petty. I think that you can, we, and we're probably, I, I wouldn't say that AstraZeneca is ahead in this area. I think there are lots of other companies that are working on, on this space. Um, is there a one that is like showcasing, I ha, I ha, you know, if, if, you, if you believe you are, <laughs> please let me know, um, because I think we're all learning in that space yeah. at the moment, together with the startup VC is, uh, is, is a bit right. of a learning area. That's that's incredible. And have you noticed with all of these things in flight, what's the type of team and skill set you have to bring in house to bring this to life? Yeah. So which skills? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So sorry, I was also picking at the at the questions. I'll call them out to you so you don't have to <laughs> worry. What's coming next? Um, so it, I have a very, very um, um, mixed team of capabilities. So you, you realize that there is no one capability then, you know, you, you need a, a big diverse party of capabilities. So we've brought lots of um, designers, uh, behavioral science, researchers um, in that um, uh, discovery side, data scientists, then within data science, you you know, you, is a difference, difference of machine learning versus, you know, all, all the different grades um, that you can get there. Obviously, scientific. You know, uh, we are a pharma company, and we are, you know, in R and D. So that scientific approach to an endpoint. If you want to bring a digital um, endpoint, you have to have that scientific background. Uh, we have physicians in the team. Um, you know, knowing obviously for, um, about the therapeutic areas, but obviously being very passionate on digital, um, and obviously um, uh, capabilities on running clinical trials. Um, and having that that experience from a regulatory perspective to be able to make sure um, we we're doing the right thing because we do get audited a lot. <laughs> Pharma yes. companies they get uh, they obviously do a lot of internal reviews to make sure that they are super clean uh, for any uh, um, healthcare um, you know inspection. Uh, so just to say, last year for example, we had six internal audits just because it's new, it's innovative. So let's make sure that we yeah. get it. Are, are, you know, and if we are going to 90% of all these studies, you know, right. are we, are we, uh, are we, so obviously being able to make sure that you're bringing the quality uh, as well as obviously all the different capabilities is critical as well. Yeah. So let's maybe double down on the oncology piece. You know, you've identified your use cases within R&D and let's say there's, I, I bet you get pinged a lot by loads of different innovators, right? Um, who are trying to make bring change in the oncology space. What is your almost kind of internal checklist, so to speak, of, of deciding what's fit for purpose besides you know, what it says on the label, but how do you decide who to work with? Um, uh, great question, and I, I do I do get ping. I, I think today is probably about twenty pings. Uh, so I, you know, if you daily you get twenty pings of so a, you can answer to everyone. Uh, so there is a bombardment. It's like hundreds of companies obviously approaching. Um, so my there are probably two school of thoughts here. There are some innovators, so some um, structures or companies or teams that basically are just looking for innovation. At first, so they are set up like an innovation hub and they're just looking for, you know, getting right. in contact with everybody. We are probably the other school of thought. <laughs> so our approach is different to say, well, we are approached by, you know, so many companies. What are the top, top problems that we need to focus on? So what would be the top problems in oncologies? Um, so we would agree with the CEO. These are our top 10 priorities that we need to solve in oncology as part of digital health. This is the value of solving those problems. And then we go and look for which companies are out there solving these problems. And obviously we use Health Excel to find uh, you know, the, all the varieties. So we don't look for the last pin last week. Uh, we look for the um, comprehensive view in terms of the landscape of providers. And uh, there are many companies that where you can find not only as well, um, all the ones that have um, 
obviously patents, but also I've got venture funding um, that where they are in terms of the journey, um, how many countries they are, they, you know, yeah. some of the, but we try to then focus on the problem that we're trying to, to solve and that landscape. So when we then reach out to obviously, so what um, the top um, players would be, we also ask for more information in terms of how they compare to others. Um, right. Surprise him that <laughs> that he makes them to do their own CI basically. Yeah, their own competitive intelligence. Then, so what's difference? You know, because then I'm comparing yeah. about twenty or thirty companies trying to solve the same problem. It's human nature. Right. To think nobody had thought of that idea before. Right. Like today, there is fifty other people <laughs> working yeah. on the same idea. What is it right. different from? So a when you start think of, it, has anybody else thought of this idea? Who are they? <laughs> Yeah. And then what is the dif the difference between what you're trying to do and everybody else's? Because that's yeah. what then I, I'm trying to do as I see the landscape of hundreds of companies trying yeah. to solve that problem. Any examples that come to mind that are operating, um, you know, digital health companies that are operating in the oncology space with an R&D that definitely stand out as, um, you know, doing good work? Maybe you're partnered with some of them. Yeah, so I think I mentioned Grail obviously previously in yeah. terms of the CTDNA. So we are partnering with um, with Grail. We're also partnering with um, uh, Tempus in the US, um, yeah. and, and probably uh, you. So so that's more on the longitudinal multimodal right. data, as um, it helps us obviously to design better studies, um, as you can then review what the standard of care for studies is. Um, from from obviously. Uh, the, the measurements in oncology or the, the devices to put in oncology, they're not that dissimilar to the devices that you need to, to get some of the assessments at home from the other therapeutic areas. So, um, you know, we've been using, for example, pulse oximeters uh, in our studies before COVID. Now yeah. everyone probably has a pulse oximeter at home as well, um, yeah. you know, to check. Um, but those are being used across the different therapeutic. In the past, we did work um, with, um, companies like Voluntis that are more, more focusing on oncology as well. Um, we, we are now looking at all the partners as well in, in that specific approach. Okay. Um, but there, there, are some, there are some companies that are much more focusing on oncology, but others that are multi-therapeutic area. Right. Yeah, you know, but um, we, we use both. <laughs> okay. Well, which is best. Um, um, we're in a trial and test phase, right? So. Yeah. I might read out this, this interesting question. It's actually from Smith Patel from Dime. And he says, due to the complex and um, heterogenic nature of oncology, we've seen um, that digital is lagging in the field of oncology compared to other TAs, uh, especially on the, well, along the whole spectrum from re research to care. So could you share any insights from AZ or generally from the industry on what the priorities are for digital opportunities as, at AZ as you look at the next two years? Yeah, so we, we are obviously quite big uh, in oncology in AstraZeneca. And actually, in terms of if I think of where, where I'm putting most of the investment is more in, in oncology than in the other TAs. So okay. the benefit, the value is, uh, is actually bigger in oncology than in the other therapeutic areas. But the person that has posed the question is absolutely right. <laughs> Because what we see is that a piece of innovation maybe would start being tested in another therapeutic area mm -hmm. first. There would be, because there is lots of excitement in terms of how to, or it's easier to, to, to see how that some technology could help in, in you know, heart, uh, a heart condition or in a respiratory condition. And then we are seeing that some of those then come to oncology a little bit later. So um, you're absolutely right. It, it seems to come later to oncology, but actually it's much bigger in oncology. Yeah. And what are your kind of priority areas for the next two years then? Um, in terms of oncology, the, the priority is basically um, uh, the ones that are specific. Um, so the, there are some that are very similar to the other TAs, the way that we run clinical trials, the way that we, we, we identify patients. In oncology specifically, then is how do we um, combine digital health with um, compounds to improve the outcome, either to improve the safety of the outcomes or um, to help to make maybe 
um, with the tolerability that you, if you're able to then take the, you know, the treatment, then you're also going to be able to get the treatment. So you should be able to get a better outcome. So helping to augment outcomes with digital health that is specific to oncology. There is a path, obviously, on computational pathology that AstraZeneca is also working. I know probably maybe um, uh, to be able to identify the markers within the tumor using digital pathology to identify more patients. And then um, in, in a specific markets, like in the UK with the NHS, we are trying to look at rather than a slice of time, like a clinical trial or a slice of time when you're having the treatment, looking at cancer in a holistic way. So if we were to cure cancer, what we would you do? So you would start doing, how do you do that early detection of cancer? So like we were right. saying, the trail, then you can use digital technology data and AI to basically making sure that the right patient is getting the right treatment based on all available yeah. You know, in, in future, I'm hoping <laughs> that we are, I think there are companies already offering as part of a lab result. It looks like you've got this, but then these treatments are applicable to you. Right. Um, but it's not that, you know, healthcare system are still not doing that. And then once they get the treatment and also post treatment, I think in oncology is very specific that cancers get continuously monitored. <coughs> there is lots of things going on. Yeah. So it's important for patients to be able to check which symptoms are normal, not normal, whether they should yeah. contact the, the, um, the physician. And it has already been proven in oncology that actually by monitoring patients, you know, you can improve the overall survival of those patients. So working holistically in terms of yeah. this is how you, you really transform uh, and, and cure yeah. cancer um, is, is one of our priorities as well. Obviously much more, it requires tons of partnerships and we are focusing in, as, you know, in, 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 in some countries to make, make, make a difference, trying to focus on in their efforts right. in every single country, but as, as a, an R&D team, they're probably quite, quite um, in, in, in that one. Yeah, that's really interesting. Almost like becoming an end-to-end -end healthcare company is the vision. Okay, um, out of curiosity, would you say that, you know, the ticket size for a partnership in R&D in digital health, is it smaller or larger or similar to a commercial one? Um, it's, it's probably a uh, um, difference. Yeah, so yeah, I agree. So it's a good question to ask. And, and you, you probably have seen a shift from um, uh, initially is seen as, you know, commercial is much faster to make that decision to do that partnership because it's true. Commercial is much quicker than R&D. Yes. Um, now, what, what happens then is the, the big bang, you know, idea, and then it dilutes uh, quite quick. So if the same exactly. quick it goes up, the same quick it goes exactly. down. Um, in R&D, probably takes a little bit more time in terms of, you know, what would be the scientific uh, approach to this solution? What would it be um, to incorporate it within um, the clinical um, trial or within the therapeutic areas? It takes longer to get that partnership moving and, and, and getting that value. But then it's a way to get it all through. So things that are obviously starting R&D, then they, they need to be launched right. in multiple countries. So yes, it's a longer <laughs> one, um, but it, you know, probably- It's got more longevity. More longevity to it or more scalability to it. Um, yeah. But we, and, and there are some partners that work with both arms of the company and we do talk right. to each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this almost makes me think aloud, if the R&D side of pharma is better suited to, dare I say, a digital health partnership, because, you know, it's just the nature of being curious and innovative and also taking the time to validate and vet and then going along the journey the full way, like you described, there's that longevity as well. Um, and then you can clearly measure the outcomes at, at the end of it. I mean, just hypothetically speaking, sounds like it's a good home for digital health. No, obviously I agree. <laughs> um, and that's, and I have worked in commercial in the past. So I worked seven years in commercial before I joined R&D. So I, I work in global commercial in a market and now back in R&D. So um, the reason is, is probably you have that tenure of seeing more strategically longer term um, and being able then to, to go through yeah. um, something that much, um, you know, it's, it's just my, much harder from a commercial perspective, they have much shorter timelines to um, prove value. Uh, you know, are you going to get more revenue this year? <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, 
Another question that, that I was thinking about is what does, is there a concept of a pilot within R&D? And does that mean, okay, we'll trial you in one trial, one region. If it works, we, you know, scale. If not, we kill it. Yeah, so we, we have a framework and probably every pharma company has a similar framework, it just has different names. So we call it the test, a start and um, a scale. So we test, you know, in one study, as you're saying, maybe on, you know, one specific indication. Um, if, it's, um, if it's positive, then we um, we call it that it's just on, on a start. It's not that it's scale yet, it's on a start. Okay. We've validated that it works. Um, when we put it at scale is what we are saying, you know, 70% of all the studies should have it as a standard or, you know, we should be doing yeah. this. And, and what we have done is do, uh, um, because it's difficult with such a large company, think about you've got 10,000 people working in R&D. Um, so making sure that every new study knows everything that has been done before and what has been learned. Right. So we've got we've done a, a digital catalog of everything, all the learnings of, it's got a hundred of devices, a hundred of solutions and services. Um, so nice. they are able to know, yes, it's been used before, these are the studies, this is feedback. So we can tell this one, yes, we had a really bad experience, <laughs> but you, you can learn from it um, versus this one, absolutely, it's being used, tested, because what pharma suffers some, a lot is from pilotitis. So because they don't share that knowledge, every study things are right. all not tested. Keep repeating that. They keep repeating the experiment before it's done. <laughs> I'm really curious, what does this database look like and how do you make sure that it stays in, uh, up to date because things rapidly evolve in this industry, right? Yes, it rapidly evolves. And obviously we are, we, we do obviously work with Health Excel in terms of knowing what is out there that we may have not used, but it's obviously a catalog of things that, you know, either we, we're starting to know about, but also things, a lot in the catalog of things that, you know, um, we, it was surprising when we went through everything that we could do, how many companies AstraZeneca had already piloted is a, you know, there are so many different people that once you start putting it together, it was a long list. So it, right. it was important. So it is, it is a SharePoint site with all this different, you know, you can do it quite quickly yeah. to be able then to, to share that information, but it's digitalized so people can then, you know, search for a, um, an assessment or share for, uh, search for a service. You know, what are you looking for? Or to help on your study and you know uh, they're available. I must also shout out um, it was actually you know with AstraZeneca we kick-started a work group last year and we put out this common sort of uh, checklist almost of how do you select vendors for your digital health clinical trial so um, you know it's interesting because those are the types of things we want to keep alive in terms of a common understanding um, like you say Okay, I'm going to read this other question that's come in. So it, I think it goes back to some of the comments we made earlier about the drug and digital therapeutic combination. And I, um, I'm going to try and contextualize this to R&D. So where do you see the most value and why, right? Is it drug digital therapeutic combination products versus standalone? What makes more sense from a business standpoint? And as you sit kind of on the R&D side, how are you thinking about this? Because that would literally mean running that drug trial, like you said earlier, you might need to sometimes do it separate to the combination trial as well. Yeah, so um, it's a good question, Adriano. Um, so a, so in terms of from a pharma perspective, the drug value, because it's already been, you know, it's a machinery that, you know, the regulation, the payer, um, you know, is, is a well oil machine. So identifying the value of that one, is always going to be bigger <laughs> than whatever digital therapeutic you can uh, put into it. So obviously that it trumps the, so yes, the digital therapeutic has to bring a lot of improved outcomes, um, but obviously it can help, but it will be, can, can it um, drive a greater um, either um, um, outcome or a, a better, um, an increased number of, of, of patients that are able then to, to take the drug. So it's basically your, your is like a, a, a relationship where you have a big brother and a little, <laughs> and a little brother. On the standalone, um, I think the value of the standalone digital therapeutics is, is still very um, small compared to, to, to obviously those drug treatments today. You know, hopefully in future is, is not the case because uh, they are digital health solutions that bring as much as bigger outcome than, than treatment. 
but is where, where it is today is that the, the, the you know it's, it's just lagging behind having everything ready in every single market to then make make that a reality. I do believe that um, um, answering the question probably in a different way. So there is obviously where do you see most of the value versus how do you see healthcare physicians and patients using it. So if every pharma company or every you know, put your shoes in terms of either a patient or a healthcare system having to deal with like oh, a hundred ideas in terms of how to solve for the diagnosis or something or how help remote monitoring of um, a different um, treatment. If there is a lot going on. Um, so where, where is that simplification? Um, so those those solutions that are amalgamating everybody else's. So yes, you can have the science in the algorithm, but you don't need a full solution. So how do we combine in some ways from a um, healthcare perspective or a um, patient perspective? Um, I'm not sure if I'm explaining this one quite clearly. So for example, the NHS um, in the UK, they, they have a national app now, obviously uh, many countries have had it as part of COVID. So rather than creating a new health monitoring solution, is it partnering with, and they do have a way to partner with the NHS so the algorithms can be part of that solution versus yeah. you know, having lots of different solutions. And, you know, and then how do you get the data back to the healthcare systems um, and being part of the workflow? So what we hear a lot from physicians is, you know, and how is that data coming back? You know, I'm the physician, you know, it's also complex from how does it go back, either from a patient perspective, having multiple ones, and also from a, from a physician perspective. Yeah. But it, we're all learning in this area. We all are yes, learning. and I think the standalone one is, is quite challenging, right, for a pharma company to think about what, what's really our business case here and how do we, yeah, how do we spend time and money on this, right? Um, okay, so here's another question. I'm going to read it as <laughs> it's quite a long one. So well, first of all, uh, Smith says, loving your insights. So one of the other observations from the field we've seen um, in terms of digital clinical measures and oncology um, offer enormous possibilities for cancer research from objectively assessing birth status to recording simple vital signs. Despite the promise, um, there's like staggeringly low, um, and then he's listed kind of some endpoints that Daima measuring 325 unique digital endpoints being used none of them are actually in oncology, right? So any insights on challenges from your end um, for all current trials at AZ, is there the lack of core measurement sets for oncology patients because, you know, the type of cancer or is the data collection through digital tools, others? So why are there no digital endpoints specifically in, in oncology is the question. So um, it, it's a very good question. And, and obviously having been in oncology um, uh, for a while or, or um, in terms of reviewing how um, clinical trials are being developed in terms of primary and secondary endpoint. Um, they is pretty much, if you don't have overall survival, they don't care about any other endpoint. So even if, and, and the earlier you go in, I, I, obviously cure happens when you identify that patient early and when you cure, you know, you give that treatment, but obviously if it's very early, it takes a long time to have overall survival because you know, you're, you're keeping them alive. So where there is a bit of a mismatch is regulators saying, you know, even with pro, um, uh, progression-free survival that has been there for years, it's just not sufficient enough uh, if, for them until they have that overall survival. And we have a study in AstraZeneca where it's very early, we're proving that um, progression-free survival being unbelievable but it's still in many countries saying, well, we just need to wait until the overall survival data. So yes, it's, it's, it's not. So here is a, you know, where they, you know, where the value gets delivered, you know, generated or the, the, the reinvestment gets generated is from a payer perspective. So obviously we do need to move payers to be able to move pharma. We, I, I did bring into my team, a uh, um, Alison Campbell, she's, she's uh, a top leader um, that you should have in one of these calls as well. And her, her, um, her background or capability is actually on uh, creating new endpoints and having the discussions with regulators. And she was one of the first um, individuals, if not the first, 
to have a patient reported outcome as part of label approved by the FDA. Right. So it's that type of individuals and capabilities that you need then to be able to, A, what is the evidence you would need for that endpoint? And but then you are able to include it in and she's focusing it on COVID. Yeah. And like you said earlier, when you spoke about the skills, it's almost, so one is, you know, the buck stops at the payers to answer that question. So you've got to make sure that they understand and that there's no misalignment when, when you line up things. And the second is, yeah, ultimately, you know, you can, you can build a strategy, but without execution, it's, it's nothing, right? It's just slides. Um, so absolutely. That's why you need those people who can, who can bridge the gap and, and ultimately, I guess, consortia as well, right? Working with other industry because everybody's in the same boat. Yeah, so for example, Alison is in 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 many of the groups, obviously from a cancer perspective, in terms of what are the you know co combining because it cannot be every pharma company going to regulators or every device company. So is that consulting in terms of what is the um, endpoints that make uh, make sense to be reviewed? And they do regulators quite like that standards across you know so because right. they learn in terms of how to review. Um, obviously, the the a study versus obviously every company bringing yet another different thing. Um, it just becomes you know how how do they 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 keep up as well. And hopefully, when we do this webinar in a year, Christina, we'll see that we've off the three fifty. We have at least two or three approved endpoints then for for oncology, right? Um, in the last few minutes, we'd love to ask you maybe you know some of your top things that you'd want to say to number one, to pharma who are looking to innovate within oncology R&D, and then also to smaller companies and startups who are trying to innovate in oncology R&D. Yeah, so maybe to, to pharma fall in love with the problem, not with the technology. So if you have a really big problem that, that, that has significant value, then it's easier then to find who the story is um, versus, so that would be my recommendation. So fall in love with the problem, not with the technology. Otherwise you'll find difficult to find the problem after the technology and you know make it happen. The second for pharma is um, think beyond the pilot. So the pharma companies get the stack on the pilot. So how are you going to make sure that you think of that scale ahead, um, you know, um, and, and also learn from previous pilots so you don't get a stuck in pilot. So that's that's quite, I think that's where we, we have been focusing on that scale and learning and making sure that we get a studies beyond, beyond the pilot. And then for startups uh, or um, digital health companies that are more established, um, know your competition, know who's out there because the people that then you, you go and talk to and hopefully you focus on the problem first, not on the solution. So that would be my, so which problem are you solving for uh, versus, oh, I've got this amazing thing. <laughs> yeah. um, and also know how you differentiate between, um, between your company and the others and what is your path to scale? So what is your path beyond, you know, the country where you probably started from? Terrific. Um, I know we have a couple of minutes, but I generally like to give you a breather, obviously, before your next call and everybody else. But Christina, this has been such an informative discussion. I can't believe the 60 minutes have nearly flown past us. Um, great insights, honestly. Thank you so much. Um, it was truly a pleasure. And thank you to everybody for joining and for your questions as well. Thank you, everyone. Have a lovely rest of the day. Yeah.